Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, host and executive producer of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Randall Beyer. We'll discuss scholarly research that we decided to examine. Welcome to Rip Rap, Randy. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. We're going to discuss Eric Hobsbawm's book, Fractured Times, Culture and Society in the 20th Century. It's a posthumous collection of his essays that he wrote, but were published after he died. Some scholars put together these essays on the notion of fractured times. I think that these essays are particularly relevant and evocative for our current situation. Hobsbawm argued that historians are not futurologists, but they can say what's happened in the past. And take a look at what's going on and now. What might point to something in the future. So be careful. If you watch the standard amount of television, this goes back to James Potter's book on media, you're seeing 18,000 murders a year. And that does include video games, which are all murders. Mm -hmm. We get numb to a certain amount of pain or the suffering of others in some ways. So another book Speaking this, of Anglo-Saxon apocalypse. <laughs> this book is kind of cool in its own way. It's manias, panics, and crashes, a history of financial crises by Charles Kindleberger and Robert Ellerber. This is the sixth edition. But it's a really cool book because it stirred up a fair amount of controversy. Uh, the authors take these sort of irrational events and start trying to put them into some kind of rational context. Uh, about is he, is he like on? a fractal scientist, one of these people that takes fractal th theory and puts it to economics? The authors are economists by training and experience who have identified patterns and irregularities and causes and effects. But what caught their eye was the emergence of the irrationalities that seem to affect those who become enmeshed in the events themselves. Any one of these events, manias, panics, or crashes, can start percolating along and come all and cause all kinds of havoc on their own. For example, they talk about asset price bubbles, which sounded pretty bad, but what they're interested in is the shape of a new financial architecture. In other words, is there some way for us to build a more rational process for handling what we're doing? Instead of this sort of irrational. Um, well, you know, it's, it, if it's come out six times, it, it's, it seems like there's a certain amount of repetition that he has the ability He's to gather data for, yeah. right? To, yeah. Tapped into it. So I wonder if one can take the data if he's developing models that can then be predictive in some way about what's, but that's what he's trying to what's do. going to happen yeah. next. Because they say any reader of this book will come away with the distinct notion that large quantities of capital sloshing around in the world should raise the possibility that they will overflow the container. Um. So one issue omitted in the, uh, omitted in the book because it's so well outside of scope is the other side of the ledger. What are the social benefits of free capital flow in its various forms? But the authors emphasize the likelihood that roughly concurrent credit bubbles in different countries are interrelated events, possible as responses to a common disturbance. It seems implausible that housing-based credit bubbles in the United States, the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Spain merely reflect the independent rolls of the dice. Hmm. So that's what he's trying to say. Okay, so this is what's all happening. Be related together you know, and what 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 is happening, and how can we influence that? Right. And um, hmm. another statement they make at the beginning, which I find fascinating, the years in the early 1970s are impressive in terms of the volatility and the prices of commodities, currencies, real estate, and stocks. 
There have been four waves of financial crises when a large number of major banks collapsed in three or four countries at the same time. Each wave was followed by a recession and, on, and, and an economic slowdown that began in 2008, which was the most severe since the Global Depression in the 1930s, to the point where in the United States, people were running out of unemployment insurance. And, when I, and what I find fascinating in this is that when this happens, those people are not counted as unemployed anymore. Yeah. And what I find fascinating, once that happens, they're not counted anymore. They're not counted as unemployed? Right. That's so ironic. There's no way of gathering yet, data. Uh, where are they getting their, their survival? I mean, how are they surviving? Well, they're not. They making ends homeless. meet. So um, they must be, yeah, they must be. Then they're, they're, they're on something like some kind of welfare roll or something like that. The other point that the two authors make is that this is truly global, involving Finland, Norway, Sweden, Asian countries like Thailand and Malaysia and China, Russia, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, United States, Britain, Spain, Ireland, Iceland, Greece, and Portugal. Another point that he makes what I find fascinating is each wave of crisis followed a wave of credit bubbles when the indebtedness of similarly placed groups of borrowers increased at a rate two or three times mm. higher than the interest rate for three, four, or more years. Mm. So there's a predictor here. If it's too good, it's too good. It's too good. And you, gotta, you don't know when it's going to hit bottom, but it will. The authors say that usually these borrowers use their money to buy real estate. That sounds familiar. Both homes and commercial properties. Although the first waves of the loans after the credit bubble were made by major international banks to governments and government-owned firms in Mexico and other developing countries for nearly 10 years. And that included Japan. Wow. You know. So he's got data for that. So I, but I guess yeah. it's in the middle. It's, um, what are some of the manias that he looks at? Is a mania a kind of fear, or is a mania a kind of just a obsession? No, I think a mania is an obsession or something that really catches fire. Yeah. Um, and then you have the Bernie Madoff. You have people t trying to exploit this process because yeah. they well, see. Well, this it is this is true of in individuals in history who have had, you know, overly weighted effect. I mean, what what astounds me about the bailout of the the car industry and the banks in the United States in the past whatever five years uh, is that uh, the individuals the individuals were not really protected. It's as if we punish uh, the individual who makes a bad uh, uh, takes a bad loan. And then ends up getting their house, you know, foreclosed under them. So sure, it's your fault, right? You took a loan, you can't pay it back. But it's just, it's just uh, disturbing that the bank allowed it to happen in the first place. Here's a very strange thing that the authors point out. The birth dates of some of the tallest buildings in the world are related to times of euphoria that existed just before a financial disaster. The Empire State Building in New York City was finished, for example, in 1929, just before the Great Depression. And then he's got a whole list of buildings, uh, including the tallest building is Burj Dubai, uh, in year 2010, which is 2,717 feet. That's enormous, yeah. You know, in the pictures I've seen, and yet, well, there's also uh, um, there was the, the World Trade Center, of, of course, but uh, a building in Malaysia, which I think was the tallest before the one in Dubai, and I wonder if they're suffering in any way from. Let's see here. Um, there's one in Taiwan, 
that was built in 2003 that's 1,670 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just sort of an odd kind of correlation. The levels with the airplanes. He would notice that, you know. Um, he says the tall buildings are as economic as the pyramids in the Egypt. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. The height, as the height of a building increases, the share of total floor space needed for elevators and non-rentable space increases in relation to the rentable floor space. Wow. They need to be stronger since the lower floors, floors must support the weight of the more upper Imagine floors. Imagine what's going on up there. I mean, yeah, it's true. Just the extra gravity, huh? or not extra gravity, but the force of gravity and ex the extra weight. Added. Well, that was the thing. With the you got a hundred stories on top of one. Yeah. Yeah. That was the thing about the World Trade Towers, which were built in the Hudson River Basin. It couldn't stand the weight of a regularly constructed skyscraper, so the builders used a metal frame and a concrete skin. Yeah. But hmm. these towers of 80, 90, or 100 stories are a visual manifestation of asset price bubbles mm. and the willingness of governments and private firms to flaunt their wealth by reaching for the sky. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I mean. Love it. It's so much but fun. didn't it start with the pyramids and, you know, we have the yeah. Eiffel Tower oh, and, yeah. and other tall buildings. Here's a comment about tulip mania. The price of Dutch tulips increased by several hundred percent in the autumn of 1636 and the increases in the prices of the more exotic flowers ballooned even larger. And that's the that same it's thing. It's true of wood and other commodities, even food. You look at nuts, <laughs> cashews, coffee, uh, any kind of or many types of, of commodities like that. I read about this, uh, the, tulip, uh, the tulip war, the tulip, the mania. tulip crash, tulip mania. Yeah, I'd, I'd come across that in the course of some of my other reading. It's really strange. The excitement, I guess, around tulips began in earnest around September 1636, when bulbs were no longer available for examination since they had been placed in the ground to blossom the following spring. So some of the buyers committed to pay for the merchandise buried in the ground that they could not see at the time of purchase. So they start speculating. Speculating. Look at salt, you know, I mean, I don't know, maybe salt's not the best one, but speculating on all of our food commodities today, you know, that they report on the agricultural food report in, in our country, you know, and then rice and uh, exports. Uh, well, here's commodity prices, asset prices, and monetary policy. Yeah. Um, but his or their attempt is to use these as indicators, key indicators of trends and of mania, uh, and, yeah, of, mania of, of what makes a panic or a, uh, an obsession kind of happen and what, what gets it going. Because it seems that it could be anything in a, in a way. Well, and then like wood, I think, is another example, you know, exotic woods. And then you have people like Bernie Madoff. See what's going on and then try to figure a way to exploit it. And of course it's based on the Ponzi scheme developed by Charles Ponzi who owned a small firm that sold deposits in the Boston suburbs in the 1930s. He promised to pay holders of these IOUs a 45% interest on a yearly basis when traditional banks were paying 3%. He used the money from the sale of deposits to pay the interest of those who had bought the IOUs before. But that's that whole Ponzi scheme. As thing. long as you keep it coming in on one end, it's kind of like cholera. You know, you can treat cholera as long as you have. I, I should. It's not. I don't mean to simplify it that way, but I've read. Let's say any kind of uh, communicable disease like that. If the if you have fresh water and you can hydrate. The body can can survive if they stay hydrated, but with a disease like that, uh, it you know unhydrates you very quickly, dehydrates you very quickly. 
As the authors point out, the liabilities from the Madoff scheme were reported to be 50 to 60 billion dollars and the losses were in the range of 20 to 25 billion. It's just astounding sometimes that you can't claim the losses back. I don't know. I don't know what. Well, there were how people whose entire savings yeah. was no, millions and millions out. of dollars. There, there, or even, even the family that had several thousand but were going to be secure, and it's all gone. But what baffles me sometimes is why you can't find it back somehow. Here's an interesting point. You said both Ponzi and Madoff shared one attribute. They traded in misinformation. Both lied about the rates of return that their clients would be earning. This is much like much of the global corruption, which involves misrepresentation about the values of the inventories involved, the values of investments, and profit rates. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's pretty clever stuff. I thought this book was not only informative, but a lot of fun. It has some pretty clever stuff in it. I, I'm not an economics person at all, but here's one about junk bonds. The two authors claim that corporate takeovers in junk bonds lead to n interesting literature. Consider the titles of both the fiction and the nonfiction. Tom Wolfe's bon bon Bonfire of the Vanities is as Remarkable description of the values of New York's financial elite, Predators Ball by Connie Brook, and um, James Stewart's Den of Thieves, mm -hmm. Ben Stein's A License to Steal. So there's a, a whole thing going on with that. I found that fascinating. But the individual entrepreneur, I guess you'd say, could have such an effect. And then I was fascinated by what the authors call this pattern of contagion, that when something starts happening, then it starts spreading around so that a huge amount of people are in trouble. Um, and he was talking 16, 18 to 1930. Contagion is probably a good, a good metaphor for these kinds of things. Well, I know that, um, I mean, we currently have a contagion in the world happening in Africa, and it's, it can be, you know, the Ebola virus could start to have enormous effects outside those four countries where it's, you know, really, really wreaking havoc now. So that kind of thing could expand. Of course, this is something you see, you've seen in plenty of movies already. The disaster movies where, you know, it's usually a virus, of, a medical virus that, uh, uh, well, I think there's even a movie called Contagion. But I think it's meta they're meta in terms of art or media, they're metaphorical for other issues that are going on globally. But applying this metaphor of disease, you know, contagion, infection, all that mm -hmm. stuff. To financial issues is quite interesting because it gives a more organic sense, I guess. They replicate, the, bio, the biological process is an apt metaphor because they replicate in, serious, in sim, uh, um, similar ways. I think what's astonishing about this book is the authors are drawing together the perspective of those dynamics and how they really are global, such as talking about these contagions that can draw together such a widely dispersed locations as Mexico City, Tokyo, Bangkok, New York, and London. So and one thing's they, happening over here, and then it starts yes, going over trickles, there, and then it starts over. boomeranging over here. Right, right. Uh, well, I, I know it gets back to some ways like, well, you know, how does the butterfly's wing cause chaos? The butterfly's disturbance of the, of the air so momentary right around you know the insect but it yet it can cause multiple effects elsewhere i mean it's one of the metaphors for chaos and and uh something small can actually ripple out into something bigger 
It would be nice if those who are involved with global finances would read books like this and develop a more reflective perspective instead of just jumping into the fray. That's not the way people are because people are not naturally selfish. There, I just said it. I think people are good at heart, but I also think they're naturally selfish. I mean, they're, they're, why, otherwise, why do the, why do the banks not, why do the banks get bailed out first before just Joe Schmo and Josina Schmo doing their work every Isn't day? Isn't that a fact in the Detroit bankruptcy thing? Is the, the deal that's being made with one of the creditors? I think so. I mean, they say the money disappears, but how? Uh, I, and th these, I admit, I do not understand this aspect of economics, but in some ways, the, you, want, you, you think, okay, you give me, you give me a, <laughs> a piece of money, and if I even make, give it to somebody else to make it invest or something like that, I guess, you know, at least I should be able to get the piece of money back. At well, some I found point. fascinating. He takes a, a surge in bank loans in the 1970s mm -hmm. and shows how it spread around, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and loaned with the hope of growing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the interest rates the banks in the United States could pay on their deposits bumped into the ceiling set by the Federal Reserve on U.S. dollar deposits. There are reasons for those restraints, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely na naive when it comes to this and uh, don't make studies of it. There's another point that the authors make here, and that is the policy responses by the government reflected what they called benign neglect. Mm. That if it's going on, they're just going to kind of leave it alone until it gets to a point where they have to deal with it. We're in an era of deregulation, yeah. so we don't have people watching the way it was legally uh, you know, mandated before. That benign neglect really sums up how these things happen, claiming that the businesses would take care of the various issues. That benign neglect, I think that really sums up how all the this... The banks will take care of it themselves, yeah. right? Oh, they're, 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 they're good go. to take care of it. Right. They're, they're the experts, let's let them handle it. That's right. But the fact that the governments are not acting responsibly because, you know, and of course the... Well, neither are the entrepreneurs. It's uh, in terms of the various crises that have happened because the, they're theoretically, you know, supposed to show profits to their shareholders. So you could also say the shareholders are not being uh, good, good public citizens. I don't know. It's a pretty fascinating book, yeah. really. And well, the manias are interesting how they play out because so much sort of wasted, wasted effort and wasted money and collapsed, you know, collapsed fortunes happened because of... Uh, In a rather deep way, this intersects with Hobbes' book because these two authors talk about the lessons of history they said the last 400 years have been replete with financial crises which often followed increases in the supplies of credit, greater investor optimism, and more rapid dynamic uh, economic growth. More and more individuals purchase securities and assets for short-term profits than the increases in their price, or from the increases in their price. As a result, asset prices increased, household wealth grew, and consumption grew. That was, as the author said, the bonfire of the vanities. Do you have another one you want to look at? Well, where did I put it? Um, the book on graduate school? Yeah, why not? I'll do a little, have a little fun with that. <laughs> What they didn't teach you in graduate school. 199 Helpful Hints for Success in Your Academic Career by Paul Gray and David E. Drew. And um, uh, the authors are professors at Claremont Graduate University in yeah. California. 
uh, one in information systems and the other in education. And uh, they, uh, they were students in six graduate programs over the course of their you know, graduate career before their PhD. They've taught at seven universities full time and they've uh, mentored over 50 PhDs. So they have, uh, they have some, some street cred, I guess you'd say, yeah. Well, it's on the politics of gathering a dissertation and I thought that was pretty interesting stuff. My question is, do they ask the fundamental question? And, you know, there's a book every year on getting your PhD, and yet we yeah. keep putting out PhDs even more this year than last year and so forth. The fundamental question is, and I don't know if it's true anymore, do you want to teach at a university? Because I've read a couple of these tomes, and the first question in one or two of them is, if you don't want to teach at a university, why would you get a PhD? That might not be the, the right question these days, but well, it's I a think, practical type of thing. I think there's some people that intend only to do research. And it doesn't mean just teach. Actually, yeah. I, said, I thought of that Work. as, as you, yeah. right. If you don't want that kind of uh, thing for your life, obviously if you're going to research you know, the Ebola virus, it helps to have a PhD. Well, the in. bottom line is, what are you going to do with it? You what know, are you going to do with what it? What are you going exactly. to do with it? Right. Why do you want it? I always resented that kind of question, but I knew, and you know in your heart it's the right question, or one of them. But isn't it possible to get a PhD without, I guess it's just innocent, for just for the love of the love of learning or the accomplishment well, I think there's of a having value. worked through yeah. that process, series of ideas and, and questions and some, something in depth, some really I something think there's really a value to taking your acquisition of knowledge to the highest possible level. I think there's a value in that. Well, thank you for being on Rip Rap again. Oh, okay. Glad to be here. <laughs>